Hey guys, this is Nick and let's celebrate the new year with Linux, open source and privacy news for the end of 2020. This time we have changes in how GNOME Shell will look in the next release, the PS5 controller being officially supported on Linux and a nifty little handheld for retro gaming that runs Ubuntu. Let's take a look right after this. This video is sponsored by Kernel Care Plus. Linux servers mostly depend on OpenSSL for their security, and this makes it a choice target for hackers. Attacks on OpenSSL represent 19% of all hostile activity globally. To keep your server safe, you need to ensure that all libraries are correctly patched for all the recent vulnerabilities. But you can't just reboot these servers every time there's an update to OpenSSL or glibc. That's where Kernel Care Plus comes in. It detects all vulnerable shared libraries in memory and automatically applies live security updates to them without requiring service restarts or server reboots. Installing Kernel Care Plus is very easy and you can deploy it to multiple servers at a time on all major Linux distributions. It will then check for new updates every 4 hours. Once installed, the software can either talk to a Kernel Care Plus patch server or you can host your own on-premises. Learn more and try Kernel Care Plus for 30 days on all your servers by clicking the link in the description below. Ok, let's begin with the Linux news. And there was an interesting article about GNOME and its health in terms of contributors. The article points out that the number of contributors to GNOME has been going down ever since the release of GNOME 3, but that 2020 was a good year with the most contributors in a long time. Half of the commits to GNOME in 2020 have been made by people who have been with the project for 10 years or more, which means that there is a loyal developer base, but also that there are a lot less one-time contributions than in the past. GNOME also looks like it's pretty dependent on paid developers, with Red Hat having the biggest number of comments by far. The conclusion is that the project is far from unhealthy, but that it peaked in 2010 and that a diminishing number of GNOME long-timers are doing more and more of the work. You should take a look, it's an interesting read. For those who have been more than troubled by the announcement that CentOS will become sort of a rolling release, there is a new project that aims to bring the same experience that CentOS used to, and it's called Rocky Linux. It's developed by the founder of CentOS, Gregory Korza. It aims to be a downstream build of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and while it's not available just yet, I'd expect it to be available before CentOS 8 becomes end of life in 2021. Another project is also willing to pick up where CentOS left off, and it's called Project Linux. This project is spearheaded by Cloud Linux, which, full disclaimer, is the sponsor of this video. These guys already have all the infrastructure and experience to maintain this new fork of Red Hat Enterprise Linux as soon as the first quarter of 2021. They'll make everything about it open source, so that the situation that CentOS users faced doesn't repeat itself, and they aim to provide a single command line that will move your CentOS 8 install to their new release. That's pretty cool. An official blog post talked about the future of GNOME Shell, and there are some interesting designs here. It lays out plans for the next GNOME 40 release and showcases a reimagined activities overview looking much like what Elementary OS is doing, plus a dock at the bottom of the screen, with each workspace being visible horizontally with its windows overlaid on top of it. The upgrade could also see some improvements with the dock on the bottom instead of the left side of the screen and all workspaces displayed above the applications themselves instead of hiding them away on the right side. I must say I think this design looks more usable and clearer for someone that isn't used to GNOME as it is right now, so I hope these make it into GNOME 40. XFC 4.16 was released and it brings a big number of changes, starting with the icons. XFC has been using a mishmash of visual styles for their icons, but now they're taking a page from GNOME's book and bringing their own app icons for their applications that fit pretty well with the GNOME guidelines. XFC 4.16 should also support fractional scaling in the display settings, which is a nice touch. The settings application now has a better search tool and the panel now is animated when hiding and has a new applet that combines the old system tray icons with the newest indicators. I didn't cover XFC much on this channel, but let me know if that could be something that interests you. I could do a full tour of this desktop, like I did on GNOME and KDE a while ago. Now let's move on to the open source news. 
People who have been following the channel for a while know that I really enjoy using E, the degoogled Android project that aims to completely remove everything Google related from your mobile OS. Well, E is now available on more phones, including the Gigaset G290, which is a recent device that goes for 260 euros. If your current Android phone isn't supported by E just yet, but you really want to give the project a shot, it could be a cheaper gateway into the world of Android ROMs. I've been using E on a Galaxy S9 Plus for a while now, and I'm really a big fan of the work the E team has been doing. Check out the video up top to know more about my experience with it. AWS, the cloud services part of Amazon, will join the Blender Development Fund and support the fantastic open source 3D tool. AWS will fund Blender for the next three years, specifically to support character animation tools development. As Amazon is trying to get into the game streaming business and creating their own games for their service, it makes sense that they would try to get open source tools to an even higher standard, so they can use these tools themselves. While I'm always wary of big tech's involvement in open source projects, these types of sponsorships are generally pretty well defined and don't give the contributors specific rights to steer or control the project they're funding, so I'm not too worried here. Sony has sent for review a new official driver for the PS5's controller, the DualSense, to be included in the Linux kernel. This means that this new controller, that has been widely praised by most reviewers as the best iteration on a PlayStation controller to date, this controller will have its Bluetooth and USB modes supported on Linux, but also the LEDs, the touchpad, the motion sensors and the rumble features. The driver doesn't support the adaptive triggers yet or the improved haptic feedback, but Sony seems open to discussion on how to implement these in a generic way. It's a fantastic effort on Sony's part, and while I prefer using Xbox controllers, because symmetrical sticks are heresy and wreck my thumbs, I'm all for more controllers working on Linux out of the box. Now let's move on to applications. KenLive 20.12 was released and it's a big update to the open source video editing software. The update features the ability to implement same track transitions, which are always nice to keep your timeline tidy. An integrated subtitling tool, which seems super easy to work with by editing subtitles directly on the timeline. The effects have been recategorized to be more legible and KenLive should now also perform better. The team also outlined their plans for 2021, including nested timelines, some more advanced streaming tools, and improvements on the GPU hardware acceleration front, which would be a huge boon for KenLive, as it's the only thing preventing me from using it these days. Darktable 3.4 was also released. For those who don't know about it, it's an open source photography workflow application, and a raw developer. This new release brings a more stable tethering view with histogram support, and modules can now be grouped and have presets to make it easier to get started. Big performance updates are also in order here, especially for the liquify, shadows and highlights, denoise and high pass modules. The color picker has also been improved. If you were held up on moving to Linux because you lacked good photo editing software, you should give Darktable a try, I've heard great things about it. Let's move on to the privacy news. The EU is moving forward with a new legislation aiming to curb the power of big tech companies. The Digital Services Act, as it's called, aims to better define who's responsible in terms of illegal content, and the companies that host content in general will have to be a lot more open about how their algorithm works if they use one to rank products. Big fines are in order in case of non-compliance, up to 10% of these companies' global annual turnover. These new rules would only apply to any platform that is home to 45 million users or more, so it's definitely aimed at big tech, and could be instrumental to break the power and the hold these companies have on the internet. We'll see if these new laws pan out, and if they don't have the same negative impact on user experience as GDPR did. Now we already knew this, but now the proof is pretty visible. Facebook does collect a ton of data. Apple rolled out privacy labels in its App Store on iOS. This feature shows users what data an application can collect to track you and what is linked to your identity. And the list for the Facebook app is very, very long, including health and fitness data, your purchases history, financial info, location, search and browsing history, usage data, diagnostics and more. It's good that users are finally given the details of what an app does and doesn't collect, 
Even though I still think it's falling short of what E offers in their App Store on their custom Android ROM, with privacy scores provided by Exodus. And let's complete this video by some Linux gaming news. Collabora announced their Wayland driver for Wine. One of the crucial missing pieces on Wayland is on its way to remove the need to use X Wayland, which is basically running an X server inside of Wayland just for gaming. Collabora added this new driver, which currently only supports OpenGL, a single display, a mouse cursor, and a QWERTY keyboard layout. It's still lacking Vulkan support, highly important for most games running with Proton, so it's far from a finished piece of software, but it's good that it exists, as X Wayland seems to have performance issues and introduces complexity and more points of failure. Valve tweaked Proton Experimental to make Red Dead Online work on Linux. Valve seems to be using Proton Experimental to add day one or at least very quick support for newer games, even though it's not fully stable yet. People who want to run the latest AAA games on Linux should probably use that version of Proton, as Valve has already fixed a bunch of issues for Cyberpunk 2077 in it, and will probably keep improving this experimental build with every new game release to ensure gamers can have the best luck possible in running these games at the expense of stability and testing. An Ubuntu-powered Nintendo Switch-like device has appeared. The Odroid Go Super is a 5-inch handheld PC running Ubuntu 20.04 LTS and the Emulation Station graphical interface, so the device supports a large range of older games. The screen is 855x480 and it uses 1GB of RAM and a quad-core ARM CPU with a Mali GPU. The specs aren't very impressive, but should be enough to run some retro games on the go. It has two analog sticks, a D-pad, four action buttons and shoulder buttons as well. You can use its micro SD card slot to add games and it obviously provides an audio jack and a USB port as well. It will retail in late January and will only cost around $80, which is very reasonable for a portable retro handheld. And that's it for this video guys, don't hesitate to like if you enjoyed or dislike if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications for more videos like this one. And if you really want to help support the channel, you can join my amazing Patreon subscribers and YouTube members and get access to a weekly exclusive Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!